All right, so a respected colleague of mine suggested that I contribute to this web website called uh, Classical Wisdom Weekly. And, you know, it's, it's a very well-intentioned website. So what they do is they pose questions of a kind of cultural or philosophical nature, and then they, they try to answer them, and they try to answer them in terms of the insights or supposed insights of, of uh, some classical authors. Anyway, I'm not going to contribute to that website, but but what I will do is I will occasionally, regularly, but occasionally answer uh, some of the questions they pose. Okay, so the last time that they posed a question, because they send emails out to their subscribers, of which I'm one, so they asked the following question. Is mental illness real? Okay, that was their question. All right, well, first of all, uh, what, what does the question mean? Uh, so when you ask, is something real, like, is Elmer Fudd real? No, Elmer Fudd is not real. Okay, so there is a concept of Elmer Fudd, but there's nothing that answers to that concept. There is a description, but there's nothing that answers to the description. There's an idea, but there is, there is uh, the, the idea has no counterpart in reality. It's not counterbalanced by anything. Okay, well, um, that's that's obviously not what they meant. Um, what What is meant when it is asked, is mental illness real, is... Um, well, first of all, I'd like to bring up a confusion, okay, which is, here is a confusion that is embodied in the question, or is likely to be embodied in it. Mental illness has to do with one's representations of reality. Okay, so if you have cancer, that does not mean that your views about reality are skewed. If you have lung cancer or whatever, if you have a respiratory problem, it does not mean that your views about reality are skewed. It means that, uh, you know, your, your lungs aren't working. If you have uh, kidney problems or liver problems, it means that your kidneys or liver is not are not working. It does not mean that your representations of reality are skewed. It does not mean that you are seeing things as, the, as they are not or failing to see them as they are. But if you have a mental illness, it does mean precisely that you are seeing things that are not there or are seeing things that are there. Or, or, or that sorry, it means that you are seeing things that are not there or that you are failing to see things that, that are there. Okay, so, and I think that when it is asked, is mental illness itself real? I think that um, part of what seems to be, part of what is being asked is, well, you know, is mental illness itself one of the the kind of non-entities that is itself a byproduct of delusive of of of, of delusive thinking. Um, well, in that case, you know, relative to the question's own terms, yes, uh, mental illness would have to exist in order for it to itself be the in order for mental illness to to be falsely believed in. You know, in other words, if it is falsely believed that there is such a thing as mental illness, if it, if it is delusively believed that there is such a thing as mental illness, then there is, for that very reason, mental illness. Well, that's sort of a clever argument. Okay, but still, let's let's go ahead and answer the question on their own terms. When it is asked, is mental illness real, what is really being asked is this. Uh, are the people who, who are supposedly mentally ill, are they just malingerers? Are they just weak people who are claiming to be sick, but really what's going on is they're just lazy or they're self-indulgent, so... You know, instead of saying that they're weak uh, and self-indulgent and that they just want to sort of enjoy their, in, enjoy being parasites, uh, you know, so instead of doing that, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, I have an illness, you know, uh, it's not my fault, uh, uh, I have to drink, I'm an, I'm an alcoholic, or I have to smoke, I'm an addict, it's not up to me, uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it, I'm just going to go ahead and indulge in my, these wretched low pleasures because uh, I have a disease, it's not my fault. So, you know, generally when it is mental, Ill, mental illness real, that is what is, uh, being asked is, is it is it something that people are simply claiming to exist because they want to continue to be their lazy loser slob selves or does it really exist? Okay, well that's a very definite question and the answer is yes, it very much does exist. Uh, and mentally ill people can be just phenomenally, utterly disciplined people. In fact, hyper discipline, hyper hyper discipline, is one way of being mentally ill. It's not the only way. I mean, there are many ways of being mentally ill. Um, there are ultimately two ways, but there are, but but underneath each of those two rubrics, there are innumerably many, literally innumerably many uh, possible uh, sub possibilities. So you know, I mean, some people. Um, so let's let's talk about what mental illness is. There there are two kinds. Okay, uh, there's neurosis and there's psychosis, and you know these terms may be dated or whatever, but the but the diagnostic categories are very much not dated. They're totally accurate, and they're never going to be dated. There are intermediate conditions, uh, but uh, still, ultimately, there are two kinds of mental illness. There's neurosis and psychosis. All right, now, psychosis has to do with estrangement from reality. Neurosis has to do with estrangement from one's own feelings. Okay, 
So, you know, the person who, who is muttering into a trash can who thinks that he's talking to a Martian, okay, that person is psychotic. Okay, now the person who uh, is, you know, compulsively kind of, uh, who, who irons his money because he's so afraid of having, uh, you know, getting, getting germs from the money or whatever, but he's otherwise hyper, but he's otherwise functional. In fact, he's hyper functional in many ways. Uh, that, that person is neurotic. Okay. And, you know, so the, 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 so the case of the person who irons his money, that's an actual case, by the way, uh, that's actually a thing. And, um, I mean, there's a specific case that I have in mind. There was a case study about such a person. Uh, and it's also something that does happen, believe it or not. In fact, quite common. Um, but so that has to do with, um, so actually that particular case, it was referenced in, in a brilliant case study by Freud called the rat man. And, uh, so this, this, um, basically this, this person, this extremely, extremely uptight person who worked for the treasury department, he was a money man. He, um, he would, he basically, he would go out and do the most, perform the most lewd acts with these prostitutes. But, but apart from that, he was incredibly punctilious. And one of the things he would do is, is, uh, iron his money. And when Freud asked him, well, you know, uh, Freud thought that, that, uh, because this guy would present, would, would give Freud as payment to all of these brand new bills. And so Freud said, ah, you know, uh, uh, you always know uh, uh, when somebody works for the Treasury Department because they give you brand new notes. And uh, and then the, the patient said, oh, no, no, those are actually old notes, but I iron them. And then Freud said, well, wait a second. Uh, don't you go out and have finger digital sex with unprotected digital sex with these, you know, gunnery and fisted prostitutes and everything? He's like, oh, well, yeah, sure. But do you realize how dirty money is? Uh, so here's what what is going on in that case. Well, two things are going on in that case. One is that there's a displacement, right? So this guy really enjoys, you know, his shenanigans with these prostitutes. Okay, that's understandable, you know. Um, whatever. Uh, you know, and he doesn't want to give that up, okay? He does not want to give that up, but... but Okay, but first of all, it is, in fact, you know, just epidemiologically, it's not a good idea, okay, because you can get diseases, right, especially doing what he was doing, right? You could get diseases. The other thing is that, un so, but he didn't want to give up his, his, uh, his, uh, so he had two things going on there. He, on the one hand, he did not want to forego this source of pleasure. On the other hand, he did want to, he, on the other hand, he wanted to avoid the, the disease-related problems that are associated with that source of pleasure, so what it is, he split the difference. He did not forego the source of pleasure, but then he ended up overcompensating when it came to hygienics and other areas of his life. He displaced. He displaced, right? And then he rationalized, right? He said, oh, well, you know, money is dirty, which it is. Okay, uh, so he ironed the bills. Um, it, it was a displacement. Okay. But then there's another thing, which is that in that particular case, it seems to me that... that um, it was not simply a displacement. The displacement had to do not merely with his wanting to continue to have, you know, this sort of sex with prostitutes, uh, the displacement also to do presumably with some kind of guilt. In other words, it seems to me that if it were simply, if it were just a sort of garden variety source of pleasure and, and were not otherwise implicated in some kind of internal conflict, I think that there wouldn't, he wouldn't have had so many resistances just to kind of acknowledging it and deal, dealing with it. Um, but I think that there are obviously a lot of other things going on. First of all, why is he going out with prostitutes? Why not just with normal women, right? Well, because obviously there was some kind of, uh, because there was some kind of inhibition there. Well, what's the, what is that inhibition about? Well, the inhibition, usually people who have a tough time, uh, you know, having relations with women, people who have to sort of go and see prostitutes, these are people who don't like women. That's why they have to, uh, that's why they, you know, they have to, uh, you know, instead of just going on a date and sort of having a normal relationship with a woman. Uh, I mean, even if somebody is just your quote unquote, you know, sex buddy, you know, you still have to hang out with them and you still have to sort of like them. Um, otherwise, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be around them long enough for them to consent to have sex with you. Right. And the thing is that if you really, really, really hate women, that's not going to happen. So, you know, you, such people end up, you know, uh, you know, going to prostitutes and that's also a very emotionally, very antiseptic thing. I mean, it's septic in, physically, but, 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 uh, you know, from a, from a disease standpoint, but from a psychological standpoint, it's very antiseptic. So probably, you know, the, the, um, the his inability to kind of confront this, um, you know, had to do with you know an inability to confront sort of a sort of profound dislike of women, which is often cloaked under shyness, okay, and actually an attitude of excessive deference towards women. Anyway, so I think a lot of things are going on there. Um, okay, but so that is an instance of neurosis, right? So the guy is very functional; he sees external things as they are, um, and he's by all benchmarks he's sane. I mean, he is in fact sane. 
you know, at least relative to one, to, to the to the better known delineation of that term. But he's very alienated from his own feelings. Okay, there's a lot going on there that he doesn't know about, so it has to come out in terms of the in in, in these uh, distorted forms. It has to come out as sim symptomological, symptomatic derivatives. Uh, it does not come out normally, and and now it is now that is a very serious illness, right? Because a lot of energy is being bled away because he cannot live the way he really wants to live. What he really wants, what he really really wants, is whether he knows it or not, is to have a relationship, you know, a gratifying relationship, but he can't, so he has to engage in these sort of pathetic kind of one-dimensional uh, proxies for relationships. And, you know, and then also the, okay, so so his, his life is, is drained of much of its richness in that way. He's not able to, you know, have relations with the opposite sex, which is one of life's great joys. Okay, there's that, but um, there's also the fact that you notice that his entire personality architecture, right, this punctiliousness, the hyper-cleanliness, the primness, the propriety, the rigidity, right, these were all ways of containing this rabid, ravenous, and perverse sexuality of his, right? So what ended up happening was that as a kind of payment, so so had he actually been a little bit more in touch with who he was, he would not have had to be this uptight guy who lived in the sort of prison of his own neurotic compulsions, and his life could have been a lot better. Okay, so that's a pretty good example of what neurosis is and also of how it's debilitating. Now, psychosis is about estrangement from reality. Okay, so that, that and and I'm not particularly knowledgeable about psychosis. I have not experienced it myself, except I suppose in so far as everyone does at some points, but I don't know that everyone does. Um, and uh, psychosis has to do with actual sort of genuinely delusive, not not just kind of not just incorrect, because he reasoned incorrectly, but but genuinely delusive. Uh, psychosis has to do with having a sort of fundamentally projective understanding of reality, okay? So um, it has to do with a kind of commingling of infantile, subjective, projective ideation with adult ideation, okay? And, and um, so an example of psychosis or a psychotic, a symptom of, of psychosis, of, of schizoaffective disorder or whatever, would be so somebody who, who you know, thinks that her, her phone conversations are being listened into, somebody who, uh, you know, uh, her, that her phone is being tapped, uh, uh, you know, and, um, but really believes it. And, and, um, and not because she's actually an organized crime figure, in which case she would be right to believe it, but, you know, because it's, uh, you know, so she, she, uh, uh, is libidinally unfulfilled, and so she's afraid that, uh, you know, so she has these these weird fears, she has these paranoid fears to the effect that, you know, some man is, uh, uh, you know, living underneath her bed is going to pounce on her. Um, but of course, that fear is really a displaced desire. So that's psychosis. Now, one thing about, one thing about psychosis is that one of the, the distinguishing features of it is that uh, it is the symptoms are egocentonic, meaning that the patient does not see the symptoms as symptoms. Okay, the patient, the 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 schizophrenic does not see his delusions as delusions. He just sees them as as uh, being correct perceptions of reality. Uh, now, the in the case of neurosis, I don't know if this is true of all neurosis. It's certainly true of many forms of it. The symptoms are often ego dystonic, meaning that the the afflicted party, the person who is sick, sees the, the neurotic person, sees the symptoms as symptoms, but nonetheless is afflicted by them. Okay, so you know, an example of a neurotic symptom the, would be the obsessive compulsive compulsions or obsessions, okay, which the, the irrationality of which is clear to the person in question, to the person who has OCD, um, but he's still afflicted by them. Uh, also, you know, another form of neurosis is very common, so people who are afflicted by torpor by my kind of fatigue when they have to work and and i mean there are medical reasons why this may happen but i'm saying setting aside physiological reasons you know people who are afflicted by fatigue or by sexual impotence uh for again not because they were you know they stepped on a landmine or something but because they actually there's some kind of emotion, emotional problem that is neurosis those are those are neurotic symptoms and and they are known to be symptoms to the uh afflicted party so mental illness is, is very real, and it's not just about will, uh, and oftentimes hypertrophied will uh, is, is a sign of mental illness, um, 
and again, that is itself um, a lot of extreme personality traits are, are ways of managing mental illness. Um, and oftentimes, you know, people who have just extreme focus, this is not always true, but who are sort of, who, who are extremists, that um, is a kind of displacement. Um, so what it means is they will often be incredibly hyper-disciplined and assiduous in their pursuit of some objective, but it's a kind of displacement because the real objective, which they're not addressing, is, is this uh, emotional disturbance. A lot of character traits, a lot of our character armor, to use a term that uh, Wilhelm Reich came up with. He was a brilliant psychoanalyst. Um, he wrote a book called, I think, Character Analysis. And uh, But a lot of... It, look, nobody is free from mental illness, okay? Um, and it's hard to distinguish. It's hard to draw the line between just kind of garden variety emotional conflict and, and neurosis. Th there is a difference, okay? But, but, but there's a lot of area of overlap. Uh, so it doesn't mean that there's no difference, but it, but it also means that um, you know, the difference between a neurotic conflict and a garden variety emotional conflict is not comparable to the difference between a cancerous cell and a healthy cell. Okay, it's not that binary. There is a difference, though. Um, in any case, but um, a lot of our personality traits are ways of managing anxiety and depression and conflict generally. And it's only those two emotional conditions, they're not exactly emotions, they seem to be more kind of conditions which have emotional derivatives, but. Um, those two kind of configurations or conditions or whatever, those are, those are neurotic, okay? Um, because fear is not neurotic, right? I mean, you see a shark swimming towards you, you're afraid. That's not neurotic, right? Now, anxiety is neurotic because the object of your anxiety is never quite what you think it is. If it were, um, so, you know, you, 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 there is some external danger and that does cause you fear, but then, but really that external danger, though an actual external danger and something that you should be afraid of, that also uh, awakens um, some kind of quasi-consciousness on your part of some internal danger or something that you're fleeing from. So it's not simply that you're afraid of the external thing. It, that, that external thing is actually a rep represents, is a kind of projection of some internal danger that you're, you're fleeing from. Uh, and so when you're dealing with that, that's kind of anxiety. And then when you're dealing with the fallout of some, of, 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 a situation that involves internal and possibly as well also external but internal dangers when you're dealing with the fallout you're dealing with depression okay so the anxiety has to do with fear of some fear of something that is half unknown then the depression has to do with failure with, with the results of failing to deal with the thing of which with the half unknown thing of which you were afraid so yes mental illness is real uh but it is important to keep in mind that there are two very different kinds psychosis which is which is um alienation from external reality and neurosis, which is alienation from internal emotional reality, two very different things. Now, another thing is that the neurotic, it is not his intellect that is damaged, it is his will. And with the psychotic, it is not his will that is damaged, it is his, it is his uh, cognizance of reality. So there are these symmetries and these asymmetries between them that are very interesting. I talk about them in my book, Neurosis and Psychosis and other psychoanalytic vignettes available on audible.com. Thank you.